Okay, so we should be officially recording now. Okay, so this is our training over treating intrusive thoughts. And oh yeah, so uh, I always like to share a little bit more with people about kind of me as a person as well. And so uh, my oldest will be five this coming March. I can't believe it. And then my youngest baby, she's turning nine months on, on Saturday. So it's kind of crazy to me that now she's been out of the belly for as long as she was in it. So that's pretty exciting. Okay, so talking about intrusive thoughts, how I got into treating intrusive thoughts, I think it kind of found me. Um, because many of you know, I started, I went through my own personal journey and struggle with postpartum depression and anxiety with my first child. And there wasn't too many resources in Oklahoma for treating it. And so once I got better, I became really passionate about treating that population. And I did not realize how common, how prevalent intrusive thoughts were in that population. And so it turned out like 80% of my practice ended up like not just with having depression and anxiety after having their children, but they struggled with a lot of intrusive thoughts and compulsions to work through them. And so I found Team CBT to be really effective, but I also found I had to do a lot of additional research to understand it and to learn how to treat it more effectively because I, I got stuck on some points, especially with using cognitive tools. And so I'll share with you why sometimes cognitive tools uh, may be counter not indicated in, in treating intrusive thoughts and how we can work around uh, some of those struggles here. All right, so what are intrusive thoughts? So you may hear intrusive thoughts as being called pure O, where that's the obsessions in OCD. So the intrusive thoughts are um, just the thoughts, the obsessions that just seem to come into your mind, a lot of times people say it feels like it's out of the blue, that then feels pretty disturbing for, for people. Um, so for all of us, we see that we all have intrusive thoughts. You all may relate, like if you've walked over a bridge, you may think like, oh my gosh, I could jump off of this and die. Or um, you may relate to if you've stopped at a stoplight, you could see yourself running over a pedestrian. Like it's not because you really want to murder somebody. And for a lot of us, we just think that thought and we like, oh, that was a weird thought. Like, and, and then it just passes. Uh, for when it develops into like a, a more of a obsession and OCD pattern, it's because the meaning that they attach to it. So they think, oh, I could run over this person. Oh my God, could I, I really do that? And then there comes um, compulsions to help them ease that fear or counter that fear. Um, and it's the meaning that they attach to the intrusive thoughts that often then creates the, the obsession cycle. So we all relate to it. Uh, overall, when people were surveyed, 90% of people say they relate to having intrusive thoughts. I think the other 10% were probably just hiding that, that it does come up for them. Uh, and in postpartum women, it is about 91% of uh, new moms and 88% of new dads find themselves struggling with unwanted and intrusive thoughts. Okay, so we've shared, th um, these are just some of the definitions that I found. So they're intrusive thoughts or obsessions uh, that are upsetting, distressing, frightening, that seems to enter your mind without you inviting them in. Um, often they don't align with your identity and values and that's why people often fight it and try to suppress it. And that's actually the cycle that keeps them getting stickier. And I'll share a little bit more about that with you. Um, pure O is actually a, a, a misnomer though, because through a lot of research, um, they find that anyone with obsessions will engage in some form of compulsions. So the misunderstanding or the confusion of calling it pure O is because people associate compulsions with more physical outward things that you can see like hand washing or checking behaviors. But with the pure O community, you'll see a lot of mental compulsions, which are very similar and it's a, the same pattern that's repetitive, mental or physical acts that they engage in to try to um, work through the distress or to, to uh, suppress the anxiety or ease the anxiety. 
Okay. So people with Pyro, you'll see more of the mental compulsions that people can't see, um, but it technically still is a form of OCD because there is going to be some form of compulsions that will be important for them to work through. Okay, what are compulsions? Mental or behavioral. So it's not just the hand washing and checking or behaviors that you can see. Um, and it's there to help them reduce the distress um, or the feared harm. <clears throat> uh, so it's, it's there, they wanna reduce the distress or uh, I, I'll engage in it so it can prevent that thing that I'm afraid of from happening in their mind, right? It's often repetitive. And um, the problem is that when they have an obsession or an intrusive thought, they want certainty that it can't happen. And so the compulsions is their attempt of trying to get certainty to make sure the imagined threat couldn't happen or try to disprove their fears. Mm -hmm. And then that often then starts the, the vicious cycle sometimes. All right. So what we see is the more that they engage with the intrusive thoughts, with these attempts, with the compulsions, the stickier the thoughts get. And so you could imagine like if, if you just had a thought of like a, a red dog and then you tell yourself, don't think of that red dog, don't think of that red color, don't think of Clifford, uh, then that's all you can think about. Then those images actually get there longer, uh, stay there and they get stickier. So the more you fight it and try to suppress it and tell yourself, don't go there, um, then the stickier the intrusive thoughts get for them. So the compulsions actually continue to fuel the cycle. So one of the quotes I really appreciated just hearing is that the compulsions are actually the fuel to your OCD. If we are able to help them stop compulsions, they no longer have the fuel to keep the disorder going. Okay, so I wanted to give you some examples of when uh, people have intrusive thoughts or in the pure O community, you'll see things like attempts of pushing the thoughts away, trying to suppress it. Um, they may excessively pray, like pray like this, this can't be true, this can't happen, because in the moment the intrusive thoughts feels like a true real threat that could come true for them. Um, reviewing memories, going back and forth of what happened, going through the details to make sure no harm was really done. Uh, reassuring themselves, I am good, I wouldn't ever do this, I wouldn't harm anyone, I won't harm my child, they are safe. So it's the reassuring themselves. Um, external physical compulsions too is often seeking reassurance from others, but that's often things that you can spot out and see. Um, mentally repeating certain words, like we're fine, we're safe, we're okay. Counting certain things like, um, you know, I have to do this certain thing at least three times. So for my client who is continuing to have intrusive thoughts that at every intersection, uh, she and her child's gonna get ran over. Um, she would count to make sure I have to check the roads at least four times and only then can, can I go. Even if like someone's honking at her, you know, she has to do that four times. So there's just that internal counting and checking. Um, and a lot of times it could feel kind of bizarre, the compulsions from the outside when we look at it, but internally it's such a painful disorder. It is so torturous. I often hear clients talk about like, it's just like they're trapped, they feel imprisoned in it. And so it can actually just be so rewarding to see them gain freedom and really get liberated from a lot of these vicious cycles that take up so much of, of their lives. Okay, um, so these are other compulsions that you could see. You can just read through the list. So I just wanted to give you a list of examples. Seeking reassurance is a huge one. Uh, Googling things, engaging in, like they're usually not superstitious, but they may engage in superstitious behaviors. And then you could read through the rest of that. But uh, safety behaviors is almost always there of like, I have to do this because the thoughts feel like they can happen, I have to engage in certain things to make sure that my environment is truly safe. So if I had an intrusive thought, and, and I wanna give you a disclaimer, I apologize if some of this is gonna be graphic, but often the intrusive thoughts are of that nature. They're like that worst case scenario that they're 
terrified of. So if you had a vision of like, I'm going to stab my child or my husband or someone I care about, they may end up going out of their way to hide knives, to um, hide anything that could be a weapon uh, to, that could hurt their family. They may end up avoiding their family. So those are the safety behaviors. Um, I have an example here of like, I had a client who just had a vision that she would drowned her child uh, while bathing him and so she would make sure that someone was always there when she was giving her child a bath so you could see how, how heartbreaking that could be but they go out of their way to actually make sure the environment is safe because the thoughts feel so dangerous and so um, again these safety behaviors in the moment really help them ease their fears for a little bit the unfortunate thing with compulsions is that they do work some of the time. So if you if you can imagine like gambling, it works some of the time to give you like some rewards, right? Like you you sometimes win. So even in the long run, you kind of drain your savings or, or you lose. That short term that works some of the time to ease your anxiety makes it so enticing and, and almost uh, addictive because you're seeking for that re relief and, and for it to work again. Okay, um, common themes that you'll see with intrusive thoughts, we often hear about contamination, that's probably the one we're most familiar with. Um, so there's excessive hand washing, et cetera. Um, but we'll see checking, I've had clients who would have to check the stove more than once, um, going to bed, laying in bed, going back to check it several times until they could go to bed, checking doors, making sure things are just right and orderly and organized. Um, harm OCD is, is probably the one that I'm most familiar with in my population where there is just this fear of harming the people that they love, uh, harming a stranger, or even harming themselves which then can kind of get confusing. But how I distinguish it from suicidal thoughts is usually when someone is struggling with depression, they have suicidal thoughts. It may bring some anxiety, but in the moment it kind of brings relief where it's like, I'm suffering so much. Having this fantasy of not living anymore can bring me a bit of relief. For a lot of my clients with fears of just like suddenly sh shooting themselves or something, it actually brings on like terror, like, oh my gosh, could I do this? Could I just snap and suddenly kill myself and leave my kids? And so you'll see that it, it really doesn't align with their values at all. They'll fight it. Um, they'll engage in ways to reassure themselves that they won't do it. And so there's more of like a frightening terror feared response to it, and it doesn't feel like, oh, this is my way out, and it gives me a little bit of a, a relief, like, like it does with, with clients with suicidal thoughts. And then sometimes um, it's really scary for them to talk about their intrusive thoughts because we are mandated reporters, right, as therapists, and so it's really important for us to do some clear assessments that this is very different from someone who may have an actual thought of violence, of wanting to kill their husband or their children or someone else. Um, so for someone with like a, a violent tendency or even like some form of psychosis, if they had a thought of harming someone, they don't really feel that terror, that anxiety in trying to fight it. Okay. Um, so, for example, if, like there are cases with clients with postpartum psychosis and they say, um, you know, I think killing my child will give them relief because they're possessed right now. Like that's their true belief. They actually don't feel that anxious about it. They feel like this is the right thing to do. When it's the, the violent thoughts with OCD, it's like, oh my gosh, this is terrifying. This is frightening. What can I do to make sure this doesn't happen. And there is zero correlation with harm coming to their loved ones when they have OCD. And in fact, it's, it's even like the opposite, like negative, less than 0% chance of harm because they actually go out of their way to avoid harm, go out of their way to engage in uh, extra barriers to make sure that harm doesn't come their way. So I think it's really important to emphasize that and to not make things worse that then we commit them inpatient or um, that we also buy into that these intrusive thoughts really could come true so we need to commit you which I have worked inpatient and I have seen that happen. 
uh, for some people. And it just creates this kind of scary, vicious cycle that, oh, my professionals think I'm dangerous too. So, um, you know, I really am bad. Sexual themes are really hard for people to talk about, um, but I definitely have seen that too with clients. Um, they have thoughts or obsessions about, did I touch my child inappropriately? Or even just the sexual thoughts that had just really bothered them. Um, thoughts uh, obsessed saying about their sexual orientation too, like, could I actually be gay or not? And then, um, and, and never really had a history of being attracted to the other sex, the opposite sex, but then it becomes an obsession for them. Uh, I haven't seen this one as much, um, but it was one of the themes that came up in some of the research that I was looking at or, or the books I was reading at. Excessive concern of whether the relationship is right, like is this one right for me, and just really kind of engaging and assessing it. Um, hyper awareness of sensory motor things like really tracking your blinking or your swallowing, oftentimes they're just really sensitive to uh, awareness of the stimuli of the environment. They're often really sensitive, compassionate people uh, when you see them uh, develop OCD. And then a hoarding. I actually, just like as I was reading and learning, I never really quite, like I, I saw hoarding as more of like a habits and addiction, which I think compulsions can often be conceptualized as, but I never really kind of saw it as o a form of OCD either. I thought it was kind of a separate thing. So that was interesting to see that lumped together, collecting trivial objects and, and then becoming very anxious with, with any attempts of trying to get rid of the possessions. Um, so I guess the intrusive thoughts for them is, I guess, the desire to collect um, there and then the, the compulsions um, is the actual behaviors of collecting and then trying to get rid of the, the stuff it brings on a lot of anxiety. Okay, so let's talk about treatment because that's what you all were here for. Um, let me pull up my chat box real quick. I saw something pop up. Okay, um, Angela, okay, loving the explanation of suicide versus like the harm OCD, fear of killing themselves. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, Phil, Philip, relationship being just right, I have one right now. Okay, great to go over this so they, they could be aware of that. Um, Gladys, can you speak to those clients who struggle with harm OCD and depression with an in increasing desire to follow through with suicide feelings hopeless? Yeah, that's really important because we're saying there, there is a distinct difference, but sometimes they could have both, right? They could have that harm OCD of ending their lives, and then they start to feel so hopeless about this whole process, and then there may actually be some real plans where it's like, yeah, I think um, ending my life will bring me relief where my loved ones are better off without me, then that would also be really important to assess like true intent, uh, serious desires to follow through. And as we talked about with the suicide assessment from the previous webinar, which you can just look up on my website and watch too on, on how we assess that and address it. I address it in the same way as I did with that previous webinar. And so you just go to teamcbttraining.com forward slash webinars, and you can look at how to address suicidal thoughts when you see that it's, it's not just the harm OCD, it's also actual desire to end their lives. Okay, uh, can getting rid of things also be a sign of OCD? Anything can actually be a compulsion. So any act, mental or physical acts that end up being a way that they try to reassure themselves, that becomes repetitive, um, like sometimes it works to ease the obsessions, but they feel like I have to continue to do this in order to, to feel better or to get certainty, um, then, then yeah, get, getting rid of things and, and anything can become um, an obsession. Even meditation, even the daily mood log can become a, a compulsion for them because they feel like, oh, this is my way of getting some thought control or getting some relief. And, and I'll show you how we can help our clients get out of that cycle. Okay. Um, I have a client with a sexual obsession. What if I am a pedophile? Marina, I, I have had that too, actually, um, where that's kind of a, very along the lines of harm OCD, where, um, you know, like, like I, I love children, um, but what if I end up actually hurting this child? No history of ever harming children, but you could see why there's so much shame in, in even talking about this intrusive thought. 
and then um, they'll go out of their way to avoid. So compulsions are like avoiding children, avoiding parks, uh, making sure others are around, are around when they're around children because uh, again, like the intrusive thoughts come, it violates their values. And, and then they start to really fight it. Like, oh my gosh, could this happen? Could I harm a child? Because likely they really value children's lives and children not getting sexually abused. And so it really frightens them and terrifies them. And so then they start to obsess about it and try to engage in ways to ease that thought or to get rid of it. And then that's when it can create that vicious OCD cycle. Okay. Do you know where and why we get random intrusive thoughts? They really don't know the cause. They kind of see it as a, a human condition where 90% of people reported that they have intrusive thoughts. And, and I'm really thinking it's closer to 100, probably the other 10 weren't disclosing. Um, but we really don't know why, like with anything, depression, anxiety, we actually truly don't know why uh, overall, why some people are, are more prone to depression, why some um, are more prone to certain forms of anxieties. Um, but the good news is we are getting better at knowing how to treat them effectively, even if it's a biological cause, even if there's a genetic background, um, environment, and whatever else is going on. Okay. All right, Andrew. Wow, there's a lot of interest in conversation here. Uh, let, let me pause a little bit and give you a little bit more information on on team and then i'll come back to the questions um, because i'll i'll say i'll, I'll have a q and a round at the at the end i'd like to make room in between as well but i want to make sure i get through some of the material for you all and then um most of uh, the people who replied to me voted to not do a practice session you just wanted more information and and to have more to, room for questions today so that's what i want to do at the end for you all here Okay, so we're looking at using team, the team model. Those new to my webinars and new to Team CBT, team is a structure that we use. These are the key ingredients that helps to us to have effective therapy. So this structure you can use with any form of methods that you wanna use. Um, but when we engage in, in this structure, it'll allow us to be a lot more effective. So testing is just measuring you know, how anxious is the client? And then are my tools working before and after every single session? Making sure we engage in a lot of empathy first. It is exposure in and of itself for a lot of clients to come and even share with you about their intrusive thoughts and obsessions. There's a lot of shame around it. And so I think it's really important to have um, time and make room and make space uh, for empathy and connection with them there. And I do a lot more psychoeducation as well uh, with this population than I usually would with many other things I'm treating. Um, assessment, uh, okay, and then I'll show you ways we'll assess the resistance to make our treatment a little bit more effective because I think a lot of the books right now on treating OCD, we really don't see assessment of resistance. We see like, okay, do exposure, do ERP with them, or that's exposure and response prevention, do mindfulness, tools with them um, and a, a whole variety of ways to help them treat it. But um, I think this resistance piece is so key and crucial to really making treatment a lot more effective. And then I'll go through some methods through our four treatment models in treating anxiety uh, for, for, and applying that on treating intrusive thoughts. Okay. So when we treat anxiety in Team CBT, we use four different treatment models. And this is what I do too when I uh, treat intrusive thoughts, I conceptualize it as anxiety, but I also conceptualize compulsions as a form of habits or addiction that then develops to help them ease the anxiety from the intrusive thoughts. The motivational model is basically agenda setting, assessment of resistance. We're looking at their motivation to change uh, using cognitive tools, but like I said, a lot of times cognitive tools that engage with the thought can backfire, so I'll show you different ways to work around that. The hidden emotion I love. It's one of my favorite tools, and I found it to be super um, 
just like profound in, in healing when, when we see various forms of anxiety, but it, especially intrusive thoughts. And then how we'll do exposure with these clients with intrusive thoughts, pure O, or more of those mental rituals instead of the physical rituals. Those already familiar with teams, sometimes I struggle with, I know some people are like brand new to teams, some people have known team for a while already, but I just want to give you the gist of my process here. So you already did some testing to measure where they're at. A lot of times their anxiety is like extreme when, when they're struggling with intrusive thoughts. You've done empathy with them and made sure you've connected. And then we do an invitation. We invite them to do the work. Does this, a, does this feel like a good time for us to transition to, to work on one of your problems? Or would you like more time to get more support from me? Or would you like more time for me to hear you out? Then we get really specific. So if they're wanting my help with intrusive thoughts and the anxiety, I then want to get a moment in time when they struggled with the intrusive thought. I find that we can be a lot more effective when we just get really specific because one moment in time when they struggle with the intrusive thought is going to be very similar to all of those moments in time. They'll have similar emotional responses, similar thoughts, and similar compulsions that they'll engage in to help ease the, the thoughts or ease the distress. So we do specificity through completing the daily mood log. This is just an example of a daily mood log put together by our awesome Angela Posh. Am I pronouncing your last name correctly, Angela? Poach, like a poached oh. egg. Oh, like a poached egg. Oh, that makes it easy to remember. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, Angela has created this awesome electronic toolkit, which has been so helpful doing tel teletherapy with our clients. So this is just an example of a mood blog that I had with a client where um, I had the thought of hurting my son while, while we were, while I was taking a bath, <clears throat> helping him take his bath, basically. And then we would uh, try to see where were their emotions when that intrusive thought came up, and then what were the thoughts that came up for them, right? <clears throat> Often you'll see the anxiety is like 100. Usually my clients are like 200. I, I don't know if it can be much higher. Um, the, we uncovered the thoughts underneath each of the emotional categories. Typically, the anxious one is the intrusive thought. A lot of times, it doesn't matter that they don't believe that thought that much. Um, because with the obsessions, even if there's a chance, uh, a probability, it then still brings on a lot of anxiety for them. So it's really not about like, oh, I only believe this 15%. It still feels terrifying that it could happen because this is the worst case scenario. So I wanna do all that I can to fight that probability, even if it was like a 1% chance that it could happen. Um, and then more often than not, I'll see some frustration and anger towards themselves or someone else too, because that's, that's kind of my sign that there could also be a hidden emotion of something going on. There's something frustrating or, or upsetting. And, and I'll go into a little bit more detail with, with that for you all, but I just wanted to give you a visual of what a daily mood log would look like for them. And then I definitely want to look at shame. Um, just through the research, um, shame plays a huge part in continuing this vicious OCD cycle. The more shame that they feel, the more they feel like they have to do compulsions. And, and so working through shame, I feel like is a pretty powerful way to use the cognitive tools even if we're not using it to directly address the content of the OCD. So shame thoughts could be like, I'm straight up crazy. Uh, this makes me a bad person. I, I shouldn't even be a mom. People will think I should be locked up. These are the thoughts that create shame and that would be important to uncover through this work. Okay, so then we're gonna go into the actual, so we do invitation to invite them to do the work. We do specificity to break down a really clear specific moment when they struggle with the intrusive thought. And then um, we'll go into looking at the motivational part here. So agenda setting or assessment of resistance has four parts. That's invitation, specificity, conceptualization, and motivation. And these are now the pieces of that fourth part, uh, the motivation piece. All right, so I don't want to jump forward too much. Uh, let me create a little bit more time to answer some questions here. Okay. So we've got an hour. 
I know it can be jam-packed with information. Um, Angela, I see your hand up. Yeah, you mentioned on that daily mood log, you know, the before percentage, which would make OCD unique, um, even if it's a low number like 15%, mm -hmm. then you still want to get it there. Um, and I might be jumping ahead, so so you can defer this question if so. Um, so what's your goal for the after? Because I know for like mood mm -hmm. work, I mean, sometimes 20% is just fine. Um, so what, what's the goal for the Good after? Question. Or is that really not important at this stage? Uh -huh. Yeah, for an intrusive thought, I actually don't even measure um, the after because my goal for them is actually to um, sit with the anxiety, sit with the fear, sit with the uncertainty. So we really don't um, want to even engage in the probability of the likelihood of the content that I will kill my child and then end up killing myself because then that actually creates a vicious cycle of then I continue to engage in the content of the thought um, that it because the probability and the likelihood of the intrusive thoughts actually doesn't matter in, in the treatment and then can actually worsen the symptoms if they're trying to measure how likely could this be. So that's a, a really good question. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Claire, I had a client who was obsessed with the need to confess a minor mistakes. Could that be an OCD? Um, yeah, um, I think that's an interesting case and we do see like confession. So when you go back to the slide of looking at different compulsions, they may have an intrusive thought and then they feel like they have to confess it in order to cleanse themselves of it. And so they may confess through their spouse, oh, this intrusive thought came up again. And so if Claire, if your client had like made mistakes and then felt like she had to continue to confess in order to feel better or less guilty about it, likely it can be conceptualized as OCD. Cindy, the difference between a client who thinks uh, their paranoid thoughts um, because she feels that she's being watched by her father, she questions her reality, for example, uh, goes to the bar but pays the tab for all her friends because she thinks they are not real. Also, when she's having sex, she thinks about her father. I've been thinking about intrusive thoughts, but she's diagnosing herself differently. Yeah, um, interesting case on... What, I, I'm kind of hearing uh, the question like maybe there's also some forms of psychosis in here, with paranoia or um, pays for the tap to all her friends because she thinks they are not real. To me, there may be some pieces of psychosis that then kind of complicates that process a little bit more. And I'm going to be honest, I, I don't have as much expertise in like treating the, the psychosis piece. Um, if there's paranoia and psychosis, there could be a form of intrusive thoughts, but, um, and these tools could still be helpful for them, but possibly I'm, I'm not sure of like getting medication management first to manage paranoia and psychosis first uh, could be more helpful. Um, I'm not um, too completely sure on that. I have to confess I don't have too much expertise in working with psychosis. Um, I suspect we all have junk or random thoughts is what Doug is saying. It's only the ones that violate our values that we attend to. The rest is drift by. E exactly, Doug. So it violates their values and that's why they continue to fight it um, so hard and then it creates that vicious cycle. And I like that you said junk thought. Like in some of my readings, I like their analogy of like intrusive thoughts are really like junk mail. It comes into your, your email, your, your inbox. And you, you don't have to tend to them, they're just there, right? But if you tended to them and engaged with them and replied to spam and then got it back, then it would create more of a, like a, a vicious, messy cycle here. Okay, there is a lot of discussion. I'm hesitant to dive into too much more because I wanna give you all of this information. And so let, let me plan on doing this. I haven't had as much conversation in the chat before with a webinar, so I'm glad it's creating that. Let me go ahead and plan to save the chat. And then when we do the Q&A, if I haven't answered your question, then, then I will. Like just open up your mic and let me know. And then anything I haven't answered, I'll read through the chat and then I'll email it out to you all. What, will that work and be okay as a plan? I just don't wanna take up too much time from, from the material here because it is a lot. It was hard for me to decide what to leave out and what to include. I, I felt like it was all pretty important in treating this. 
Okay, addressing outcome resistance. Why might a client uh, not want to feel less anxious or feel less of their negative feelings around this struggle? So part of them wants change and then another part feels hesitant. So how we work through that, I'm not gonna go too much into like the miracle cure magic button, et cetera. Um, but I think a really key piece is positively reframing the negative thoughts and emotions. So the, for the client that I identified, she felt guilty, she felt sad, even the anxiety intrusive thought, around the intrusive thoughts, felt angry. How could that benefit her? What does that show about her that's really positive? Right, I'm sad because I, I care about my child. And even the intrusive thoughts when we're talking about working through shame, a lot of times they definitely wanna just completely get rid of the intrusive thoughts. And so this can be pretty powerful to look at the content of the intrusive thoughts and honor their values behind it. Why does this bother them so much? Because my child's life is so important to me. I had another client that just kept feeling terrified that her children won't go to heaven. Um, and so why does that bother her so much that then she has to pray it away or pray with them and, and do all of these rituals? because it's so important to her that, you know, her children know God and that they're kind people and that they're, uh, um, they just live a life that's, that's meaningful and, and, and treats others well was, was her values. And so that did a lot for her in shedding the shame of, of having these thoughts that initially felt so bizarre and even crazy. You know, a lot of times you'll hear those labels that they have for themselves. Um, so what does it show about them and their values that's actually really positive? My anxiety shows I really care about something that really matters. Why am I terrified that I could kill myself? Well, I really care about being there for my family. Why am I terrified that I ran over some stranger? Like I had a, a client who literally went and checked at least three or four times if she ran over a speed bump or even a pothole. She would drive around the block again to make sure she didn't see a body. Why did that matter so much to her, though, that she didn't kill somebody, right? Because life matters to her. Um, it isn't just something that she brushes off. And so I find the positive reframing to be really powerful in helping them work through shame um, and just connect with their values. I started to fight this thought because something really mattered to me that I didn't want to come true. And then I thought this quote was really um, powerful in some of the research on the strongest predictor of the quality of life for someone with OCD is not how bad their OCD symptoms are, but how much shame they experience about it, around it. So I find that just going through the motivational model and then the cognitive tools that helps them to work through shame is a powerful way to start the healing process even before we do any exposure and try to get rid of the thoughts. Then it's also really important to address process resistance because exposure is going to be a big part. And so how I do that with them is, um, you know, of course, we would dangle the carrot and all of that stuff. Are they willing to do exposure? Um, it's going to feel scary, but also a really effective way to help them uh, heal. Um, but then I go into really identifying from that moment in time that they chose in their mood log, like for my client, you know, 6.30, I was giving my child a bath and then I saw myself harming him or drowning him. What are the compulsions that come up for them? And then I just provide a lot of psychoeducation, just the pieces that I've shared with you on like how the compulsions are the fuel for the OCD. The more we fight it and engage with the thought and seek reassurance, the stickier the thoughts get. And so if we want to heal, we do have to do some exposure. Um, so I give them psychoeducation, but then we go into getting paradoxical, right? This is the piece I feel like is missed in a lot of the treatment is, what are the benefits of doing your compulsions? You're doing them for a reason. You are truly getting some real benefits out of them. Um, and so as they may say, in the moment, I've had clients who say, I, I, could e I even knew that, like I had a client just last week, in her words, she said, I even knew in the moment what I was doing was batshit crazy, but it actually helped me to feel better. So for her example, she like, like gave some food to this homeless man and then, you know, he was starting to like, he, he was kind of psychotic and started to get angry. And so she left, but then the intrusive thoughts came on like, okay, 
this man is angry. He's going to uh, remember my license plate. He's going to look it up, even though he doesn't have a computer. And then he's going to come to our house and murder us. Like that was her intrusive thought. She said it just cycled so fast into that. And so her compulsions, she said, in the moment, I knew I was batshit crazy. But I, I kept like I made sure we, uh, you know, I covered my license plate. I made sure the garage door was closed. I had my husband continue to come out and check to make sure that the garage was closed and that no one was outside. Um, and so even in the moment, even when they know it, it is so compelling and enticing because for her, the benefit was I did feel better. I felt like I was protecting my children. Wouldn't that be a powerful benefit? I felt like I was protecting our lives. It eases my anxiety. For the moment, I felt like we're safe. These are There are some pretty powerful reasons why they engage in the compulsions. Even the hand washing, for the moment, I feel like I'm protecting my child from dying or us. Um, or for, from them getting really sick or something like that, right? Uh, what do the compulsions show about the client that's actually really positive? They really care about something. Um, so I feel like this piece alone helps them to work through shame because they've never really looked at the compulsions in this way. It just felt like a, a batshit crazy thing that they engaged in. And then it would be really important to voice the resistance. So this is something I often use more with, with habits and addiction. But after I have them list a whole thorough um, exhaustive list of how do your compulsions benefit you in that moment in time when you engaged in uh, checking to make sure your child's safe, etc. What did it do for you? What does it show about you that's really positive? After I um, basically positively reframe their compulsions, I would then have them rate zero to a hundred. How motivated are you to work through these compulsions considering all of these powerful benefits? And it's stemming from these values, right? A lot of times it could still be high because they want to heal and get better. But once they uncover these reasons why they've continued these compulsions, it could get lower. They may say it's 50% or 40%. And then um, I wanted to bring this to life for you, but I'm afraid a demo may um, take up too much of the time here. So then the whole point of voicing the resistance is that I'm not, I'm no longer the person after the psychoeducation piece, I'm no longer the person that's telling them, Oh, if you continue these compulsions, it's going to make your disorder worse. I take on the voice of the resistance and let them voice, take on the voice of change. So I look at that list and I say, well, considering all of these powerful benefits, like, you know, in the moment when you're engaging in that compulsion or you're seeking reassurance, you feel better. Your, your anxiety is eased. Um, why would you, why should we do this work to, to let go of your compulsions? Um, and so I would let them take on the voice of change. So they say, yeah, it may help me in the short term, but in the long term, I, I know it makes things worse. Like I know my disorder is so much worse now, two years um, into it compared to when it started out. Right? And then we continue to to voice the resistance. I hear you, but at that moment, you can truly feel like you're safe. At that moment, you truly feel like you can protect your child. Why should we work through these compulsions? Um, and then they say, it's an illusion of safety, but actually I'm spending so much time engaging in the obsessions and the compulsions that I'm actually taking time away from being with my child. So it's a lot more powerful for them to take on the voice of change. And after they do that, I then rate their motivation to change because you'll see that they'll have these, like it's this internal battle that comes up. And so often with my clients, after they take on the voice of change, their motivation to do this work really increases. So from the 50, it could go up to 80 or something along those lines. I want to make sure that they write down all of this and have it in, with an easy access. Because there will come a moment in the very near future that the voice of the compulsions are going to come back and say, I need to do this to ease my anxiety. This is the only way my kids will be safe. And then I want them to be able to pull this up and have that compulsive thought, the thoughts about the compulsions and its benefit, and then that they talk back to it. Yes, but in the long run, etc. And so this is a tool that can help to continue to 
um, drive motivation because then they also have that voice of change that's easy to forget in the moment of the compulsions. And then it's actually helpful to even read it before they have compulsions. So for some of my clients, like typically in the morning or before bath time, they're more likely to have really strong compulsions or urges. Um, then it's, it's important to just read this list beforehand. I only move forward with exposure if their after rating of motivation to change is at least at least well above 50. Um, because if they say like, oh, I still feel about 50% motivated to change, we're gonna have a lot more resistance when we try to do exposure because right now, like a good part of them is saying, this is still benefiting me. I'm, this may not be the best time for them to do this work. And when I say that, I'm genuine. I'm not trying to be manipulative so they can try to convince me they want change. I, I say, you know, I'm, I'm hearing you're kind of torn. 50% of you wants to get better, but 50% is really still seeing a lot of benefit to the compulsions because it truly eases your anxiety and helps you to feel safe. And I'm wondering if this may not be the best time to do this work. Like, and I truly mean that, you know. And then they may argue for change or, or they may not. And they may say they're not ready. Um, more often than not, though, by the time they come in and get help, they often are ready. But it's just important to uncover this process of understanding the benefit. Okay, I'm hearing some background noise. I thought I had muted. Okay, I don't know how to do that without opening up the whole thing. So give me a second. Okay, that should mute all of the background noise again. Um, and, and did you know the average length of time that it takes for people to get help with OCD is 10 years? I never knew that. That because of their so much shame and suffering, the average length of time from the point of when they started to struggle with intrusive thoughts and compulsions to the time that they got help was 10 years. So a lot of people say, I should have gotten help better. Why did I let this go on for four or five years? Uh, on average, it's about 10, just because there is so much shame around the struggle and hopelessness about things getting better. And also really seeing the benefit of the compulsions too. Okay. Yeah, so I have them keep it on their phone, especially when they feel really tempted or even before. Okay, so that's the motivational model, one of the four, right? And then we have the cognitive model. Okay, so the cognitive model is often effective with thoughts about the meaning of having intrusive thoughts. So because I have these intrusive thoughts, that means I'm crazy. Because I have this, this makes me a bad person or, um, you know, I'm no good. My loved ones are better off without me, etc. So the not the content of the intrusive thoughts. I, I kind of leave them alone when I use cognitive tools, but the thoughts tied to the other emotions of loneliness, like no one gets it, the shame thoughts, the sad thoughts, uh, hopeless thoughts like I'll never get better. The cognitive tools are often more effective with. That thought number two that I shared with you on, on the mood log where she said, um, you know, I could kill my child and then kill myself. I, I often don't even touch that with cognitive tools. Because um, it's often not effective with the intrusive thoughts. And I had to learn that the hard way. Like I had clients who started to identify the distortions in their intrusive thought. And then like they felt more anxious and they felt worse, even though they believed the thoughts less. That was so confusing to me. And then like they engage in the double standard and they had like all of these great things to say, like, no, you wouldn't ever hurt your child. You love your child, et cetera. Um, but then they would still feel quite anxious. Um, and then it, it just wouldn't, wouldn't ease the symptoms or it would come back even worse. And so we, I found and realized through just engaging in more reading is because the cognitive tools often becomes a way of like them trying to seek certainty, trying to disprove the thought, reassure themselves. And we know any moment that they're trying to engage in the content of the thought to disprove it, to decrease the certainty, to push it away because it feels like the thought has meaning, like it's gonna come true, um, then makes the thought stickier. So when the thoughts are there and then I engage in the content and try to argue with it or reassure it, 
or disprove it or seek certainty for it, uh, my symptoms actually get worse in the long run because that becomes a compulsion in and of itself. So you may at times even see clients then use cognitive tools almost as a compulsion to, to help them ease their anxiety. Or why do you think examine the evidence could be a problem? Or the double standard method if they had the thought like, I could kill my child or I ran over somebody. And the chat is filled so I, probably if you had a thought, you could open your mic. How could that be problematic for them to examine the likelihood of them harming somebody? Hi, Anne, this is Bridget. Um, hi, Bridget. I was just gonna say, hi, um, thank you for doing this. Um, yeah, I think maybe just because of what you said about the certainty being so important to them, that if you examine the evidence, even if the propensity of the evidence argues against the thought, if there's that mm -hmm. slight possibility, which there always is, then mm -hmm. that continues the obsessive. Exactly. Because um, we cannot get 100% certainty about anything in life. That's just not how the world works. And a lot of times examine the evidence is almost like that seeking of certainty and um, even a, a small percentage then can continue to keep up that vicious cycle for them because they would still want to quelch even a 1% chance of possible harm coming to someone. Right? Yeah, thank you for articulating that so well. And then it could just be a way of continuing to engage in the content of the thought, like, like the thought was real or that it matters. It's their way of seeking reassurance. Like that double standard friend continues to reassure them that they're, they're fine and then it could make the disorder worse. Okay, so it's much more effective to do exposure types of responses. Um, and I'll show you how I've done externalization of voices with important exposure components, like not engaging in the content of the thought at all. I'll, I'll give you an example of that when I get go into exposure. And then it could also be effective with self-doubt thoughts. So before, so I'll do some um, exposure in session. But a lot of times they've struggled with this for so long or it's been so hard to overcome that they still have doubts that they could really do this at home or to get better. And so I do find like the double standard method can be really helpful for self-doubt thoughts. So before I give exposure as homework, I would say, where's your self-doubt zero to 100 that you can do this? A lot of times it's like even like 60 or 70 percent. And then I would uncover what are the thoughts driving your self-doubt? This is too hard. I won't be able to do this. How much do you believe these thoughts? And then I would use like identifying the distortions, um, but usually just like the double standard method with it. Um, and I've had a client, these were her exact thoughts. And she said, um, so, you know, as as her friend, I said, you know, this is too hard. I don't think I can do this. And her response was, you know, you've done hard things in your life. You've, you've worked through many hard things. You've gotten to where you are today because you've worked through hard things. And so um, just because it's hard doesn't mean you can't do it because you've shown that you can. And so just, just hearing that was pretty powerful for her. So her self-doubt was like about 40% and then uh, it was like starting off at like about 80% because she had struggled, I think, for about four years by the time she came to see me. And then just after the double standard method, it decreased to about 30%. Still scary, still felt, you know, some discouragement, but it really just allowed her to feel like she can do it and to move forward. So that can be helpful. Okay, so motivational model, looking through uh, motivation to change and honoring the symptoms and even the compulsions. The cognitive model for thoughts not that are not the intrusive thoughts, thoughts tied to shame, thoughts tied to sadness, loneliness, embarrassment. And then we have uh, the hidden emotion. I found this to be quite powerful for people with intrusive thoughts most of the time. Um, often there is a hidden emotion or desire. So what Dr. Burns has found in his research is that 70 to 80% of cases of anxiety, including OCD, but it could be panic attacks, hypochondriasis, over-worrying, any form of anxiety, um, there is likely a problem that they're not dealing with. They're sweeping it under the rug because they want to be nice, to not rock the boat. Almost always my clients with OCD, I see them 
have this trait of they, they want to be nice. They're kind of conflict phobic. Um, they're compassionate people. They don't want to hurt people's feelings. And so oftentimes you'll see them hide things that are bothering them. The problem is always in the here and now, likely. <clears throat> Although I have had some clients um, had intrusive thoughts because there was a trauma that they went through that they haven't revealed or worked through. Um, but then that, that would be more of like a, a trauma symptom. So the intrusive thoughts come up and then they just had to finally reveal the trauma and to work through it. So the exposure is with the trauma. But when it comes to the hidden emotion, um, the problem's always in the here and now. Something's just really bothering them. And so we have to do two parts with this tool. The hidden emotion is a two-step process. The first step is gaining insight. So let's look at this moment when you had that intrusive thought like from that daily mood log. Was there something that just happened before that? Was there something that came up that was bothering you that you weren't addressing? Um, possibly it's tied to something that made you frustrated or angry or upset, um, but not always. Uh, or maybe there was even a hidden desire going on. So I try to just open-endedly, first I share with them about the hidden emotion, just like I'm reading to you. Often in about 70-80% of cases of anxiety, we see a hidden emotion. This could be one of the things going on that's driving your anxiety or your OCD. And so, um, you know, we'll, we'll just try out this tool to see, is there something going on that you're not addressing that would be important? So I go into that moment. And then like for my client with the bath, ultimately she actually, you know, and then she's wanting like her, her husband around to monitor to make sure she doesn't hurt her child. Ultimately, she wanted just more help, like she felt overwhelmed with parenting. And then the husband a lot of times was like on his phone, overworking, even sometimes worked up to like 60 to 70 hours. And so the problem for her was actually feeling pretty lonely and frustrated in this process, sometimes resentful of how challenging it was. And so the insight for her was that, oh, I'm actually kind of pissed off at my husband and resenting him and feeling lonely in this process. And then the action is you have to do something about it. You have to share your anger and you know, some people it's like, I'm having panic attacks at work, I have to find a new job or just change departments, like this one just doesn't align with me. Um, but you have to do something about it before it gets better. So if it's revealing anger, it's gonna be pretty threatening for them. And so I would often teach them the five secrets of effective communication. But before I even do that, I even look at what are all of the good reasons to not reveal your anger? What are all of the good reasons why you've held this in? Like for my client who was actually upset with mother-in-law who would text like six times a day to check in, give advice, tell her what to do. She started to have panic attacks and even intrusive thoughts. Um, it was, it felt very threatening to, to, talk to her and tell her stop texting so much and so we have to honor why did the hidden emotion come up why did we sweep it under the rug um, because I really care about relationships I don't want to hurt my mother-in-law's feelings I don't want to burn bridges hurt our family dynamic and then I would have to feel convinced that they want to still uh, engage in the action part before we move forward with teaching them communication to reveal it so I say, well, it's really important in order for anxiety to get better, we have to do something about it. There may be some good reasons why you haven't shared your anger. What are all of those good reasons? And then I would get paradoxical. And despite these good reasons to hide your anger and to not share why you're upset with your mother-in-law, why would you want to do that? So only if their voice of change wins, well, I don't want to continue to stay so anxious. And it sounds like these tools can help me have a voice and not hurt her feelings or something like that. It's important to me that um, I, stop, I stop this process of just hiding everything that I want, right? Or maybe it's time that I have a voice about my wishes. Then we'll, we'll move forward with revealing the hidden emotion. Um, I've had a lot of different examples of hidden emotions. I've had clients who actually wanted to go back to work. So it wasn't even like a an anger towards a person, it was like, I actually want to go back to work. I feel guilty about that. And so I feel like I need to stay home. Um, but it was finding a balanced solution that addressed their hidden desire that eventually helped the intrusive thoughts. Some people actually wanted to stay at home and didn't want to work. And so it just depends on their hidden desire or their scenario. And the disclaimer with this tool is that 
um, kind of let it go if they say there really isn't a hidden emotion because sometimes it isn't at the forefront of their mind. Oftentimes we as therapists don't know what it is. So I just word it tentatively. You know, often in cases of anxiety, there could be a hidden emotion. Could you see a problem going on that you're not addressing? If they say no, I, I would just give it to them as homework. Um, so yeah, just kind of think about it. Track when your intrusive thoughts come up or when they flare up. See, was there anything just going on right before that or around that that really bothered you? And then sometimes my clients would have like an insight or an aha uh, through their homework because oftentimes they're the ones that can figure out what's bothering them. Oftentimes we don't know. Um, like I had a client who ultimately realized she didn't want to be in business with her, her uh, in-laws. They were owning a business together and then um, she didn't actually want to get wrapped up in that with family anymore. And I wouldn't have known that. I didn't know they were in business together, but it was her who figured it out. Um, I kept having panic attacks. And then I realized it was often around when we we're talking about the business or dealing with it that I, I finally had to address that I, I don't want to do this. <clears throat> okay, so that's the hidden emotion. So yeah, the, the main points are you educate them about it, but don't push it. A lot of times it will eventually come up, like Dr. Burns just sometimes tentatively ask them once or twice a session, could there be a hidden emotion going on? Is there something bothering you that you're not addressing or giving a voice to? Um, and yeah, just give us homework and kind of let them figure it out and track their own patterns. And usually if it is a hidden emotion, just the insight in and of itself often helps to ease some of the anxiety symptoms and then the action seems to help ease a lot more of it. A lot of times exposure though is still a very important and key component in healing because now it's kind of become this pattern that's ingrained that they feel like they have to continue. Okay. So the rationale for exposure and response prevention is that um, here, the more compulsions that you do, sorry, let me, can't see my slides. The more compulsions that you do, the more you reinforce this cycle. The obsessions will grow stronger, <clears throat> and then those drives to, the drive to do compulsions will go stronger, and then it just goes round and round. It's that circular causality. Compulsions make intrusive thoughts worse. Intrusive thoughts getting worse makes the compulsions worse. And so to beat the obsession, you need to starve it out, starve out this cycle, which means that you need to target and eliminate compulsions. So you have them um, face the stimuli, which is the exposure, face the source of fear, without engaging in the compulsions, which is the fuel for their OCD, which is that response prevention piece. And that's how they heal. Okay, so as you know, Dr. Burns says, go towards, towards the source of fear and face the monster and you will, you'll realize it has no teeth. Um, but I don't wanna minimize how terrifying this is. This takes a lot of courage. And to be honest with you, I'm not to that space of um, a Jill Levitt where she's like, I get kind of excited doing exposure because I know the healing that they'll get. I always actually feel at least moderately anxious <laughs> before I do some exposure with the client because like it's so hard to see them suffer. It's often so terrifying for them. Like they're crying, they're anxious. I've had clients have panic attacks while they were doing exposure. And so it's, it's intense, um, but also can be just quite liberating and rewarding to see them come out the other side. Okay, exposure will help the client rec uh, recreate this. So the exposure helps them recreate the source of anxiety, think of the intrusive thoughts through cognitive scripts, uh, contaminate their hands, and actually practice letting go of compulsions. The whole key is that despite having these intrusive thoughts, I let them be there without engaging in any kind of efforts to reassure them, to ease them, to suppress them, et cetera. <clears throat> Okay. All right. And then when we continue to practice this new cycle of, yes, the intrusive thoughts are there and I'm feeling anxious, but I don't have to engage in the compulsions to ease them anymore, the thoughts will get less sticky. Uh, they don't hang on as strong. Um, <clears throat> and then over time, they do habituate, which is, you know, they feel better. Physically, they feel better. Uh, they find that the intrusive thoughts are easier to tolerate. Some clients start to even think like, oh, that thought, it, it just feels kind of silly. And, and then, and or it just inhibits this fear response. And then ultimately you just see them gain this, this freedom over it or feel em empowered 
And then of course it's important to do some relapse prevention too, because we know like even when they work through it, likely there are times when it could come up again, especially if it's a hidden emotion or just when they're feeling vulnerable, stressed, sleep deprived, we see like more intrusive thoughts come up at, at that time. So we want to prepare them for that. The goal is not to eliminate intrusive thoughts. That likely is not realistic. The goal is to, even when intrusive thoughts come up, um, I don't engage with them and do compulsions that will then make this cycle worse. And then I can proceed with life. All right, so there's two forms of exposure that I do with clients. And you could also do interoceptive exposure, which is just kind of getting them familiar with the anxiety sensations and, and then feel okay with it, that it's uncomfortable, that it's not dangerous. The whole theme with exposure is we want to get them outside of their comfort zone, but not get them out of their safety zone, okay? So if they have like a fear of like shooting themselves, they don't need to be holding like a loaded gun to do exposure that may be getting outside of their safety zone. So it's really important to craft an exposure that doesn't get them outside of their safety zone. And it's probably even more effective to just do some cognitive exposure or an unloaded gun that, that they, they could hold around or, or, or sleep with. Um, here and now exposure with intrusive thoughts is how I start with the client. So when the intrusive thoughts come up, I want to get clear on um, what is it that you typically do when your intrusive thoughts come up? What are your safety behaviors? What are the compulsions? And then I walk them through how to respond to it instead of doing those compulsions or those mental acts, mental rituals. <clears throat> okay so the first thing we want them to do is just recognize and label this is an intrusive thought so this is more of like that mindfulness technique where you just step outside of yourself and observe you as a person having this thought and then you just label it so you could see how that's very different from like oh my god this could come up again i, I could hurt my child versus this is an intrusive thought <clears throat> okay and then accept and allow and I'll uh, share with you the source of, of this. So recognize and label and then accept and allow. This is really hard and challenging, but exposure means I just allow the thoughts to be there. I know the thoughts are automatic. They are best left alone because anytime I engage with them, they're going to stick harder. It'll create this vicious cycle. So I just allow them to be in my mind. I don't engage in efforts to push them away, suppress them, pray them away. Um, and again, I wanna get a list of exactly what they do to make sure they know so they can work through that. Um, they don't have to excessively pray. Prayer is great and wonderful. In the moment of exposure, it can um, continue to make the issue worse though. So if they excessively pray it away, they're again still engaging in the thought, engaging in the content of the thought. And even having like this empowered bring it on attitude, like you can stay there as long as you want. Um, and like I put in the positive reframing piece because we can even still connect it with the values of like, you know, you're there because you're trying to protect my child. You can stay as long as you want. And I'm just going to continue to move forward with life, right? Okay, this is regarding the sensations that they try to suppress as well because it is so uncomfortable and frightening. And so this float and feel is almost kind of like a mindfulness technique as well where you just then objectively notice your feelings and sensations and just let them be there as well. Like, I know this is an intrusive thought. I notice my heart is racing. Um, I know it's intrusive because I'm feeling frightened. I have a sinking feeling in my stomach. So you just notice it and then you just let time pass. You don't have to do anything with it to suppress it, to engage with it. And I always practice this with them. I'll have them bring up the intrusive thought in session. And then we practice going through this whole process. And just let time pass. We don't have to rush it and urge it. And even some of the readings that I had, if they literally slowed down, because when they have the intrusive thoughts, they're in this frantic flight state. I got to explain to suppress, I gotta distract, they, they are in this heightened fast movement state. So even if they literally slow down their movements and their actions to just let time pass, because while this thought feels terrifying, it truly actually has no meaning. How would I act if it had no meaning? I would just slow down and continue to move forward with life. And so that last piece is proceed with life anyway. 
Even while I'm having the intrusive thoughts, I continue whatever I was doing. I act as if the thought had no meaning um, and literally just slow, slow down instead of running away from it. And so proceeding with life, like for my client who wanted to take her child for a walk on a stroller, um, but then kept having intrusive thoughts that someone will kidnap her child, then like wouldn't go. Um, she may cancel plans, cancel appointments, cancel uh, dates with girlfriends. This was before the pandemic, of course. Um, so proceeding with life with her was actually, I'm going to move forward with plans and not cancel them anymore. And that like felt so empowering for her. And so you could see how that alone could help with depression. You're engaging and you're socializing again. And so this, while it was terrifying, proceeding with life, despite having those thoughts, is that moment of empowerment and reclaiming their life again. Um, and this is from um, overcoming intrusive thoughts, um, overcoming unwanted intrusive thoughts. I've, I think that's a really good book that is like user friendly. You can let, refer it to your clients too, but I think it's a good guide for therapists as well. Okay. So I shared with you that sometimes I'll do externalization of voices with them, but with exposure components. So this is how it could look like. Okay. Let me see what time it is. I want to give you 15 minutes for questions. Okay, we got like, I'm, I'm going to go through this as, as thoroughly as I can while not make, giving you time for questions, but not losing the content of the importance here. Okay, so as the therapist, we again, I guide them through how to not engage with the content first. And then externalization of voices could be like, you know, you could snap and kill your child and end up killing yourself. And that could feel really horrible as a therapist to, to say and to, to tell them, but this is the intrusive thought that comes up for them all the time, right? And then this is the response that they could have here that incorporates all of those exposure components. Like, okay, this is an intrusive thought. I know this because my body feels tense. I feel frightened hearing it. My, my chest is tightening up. Um, but you know, as the intrusive thought, you're trying to protect my child in your own weird way. So you can stay as long as you want, um, but a thought is just a thought. And despite the risk, I'm choosing to proceed with life anyway. Um, so they may also add things like nothing is certain in life. And I, I got to stop trying to get certainty with everything because I just can't. Um, there's risks with everything, including driving, traveling, and really just existing. So I'm choosing to bathe my child and spend time with him despite the risk because I want to care for him and connect with him. And I want to live my life aligning with my values instead of being dictated by my OCD or the fears. Um, so this was an actual response of a couple of my clients. I try to. Um, you know, keep things confidential, but this is typically kind of the response that they may have. Um, and then it's important for them to be able to practice this. And so you can see this didn't engage with the probability of killing their child. It's actually accepting uncertainty. Yeah, there, there's certain risk in life with everything that I do. And despite the risk, I'm gonna proceed with life anyway. Okay. Um, they're not reassuring themselves, like, no, you're not gonna kill your child. That won't happen, you won't do that. That, and if I see that, I would then guide them through, right? So I'll listen to those pieces because I've had a client who would walk through this. She knew the pieces, but she still said things like, you love your child so much, you're a good mom. That's a reassuring thought. So we don't want to engage in the pieces of the content because the thought actually has no meaning. We don't need to engage with the meaning of it, the likelihood of it, uh, seek reassurance about it. Right? You just think, this is just a thought, stay as long as you want. I thought it's just a thought, I'm going to proceed with life anyway. So I'll catch those pieces and then I'll make sure in their next response. And typically what's interesting is like the, the thoughts that has reassurances, like everything will be okay, actually often doesn't get that huge win. But when I, they incorporate the exposure components, then it actually does feel like a huge win to them when I measure it. And so I'll talk to them about it, make sure we remove those pieces of gaining certainty, trying to disprove the content, um, reassuring themselves that everything will be okay. Then it actually feels like a huge win for them. Planned practice is really important. So I said there's the here and now exposure. As the thoughts come up, this is how you respond to not make the OCD worse. 
but the planned practice is a key piece for a lot of people. Doing cognitive exposure, the cognitive scripts may feel quite gruesome for them, but actually the more brutal it is and direct it is, the more impactful for their healing. Um, so I'll have them do it as homework. I don't even start the cognitive exposure until they agree that they'll do it as homework. I, I won't begin it because it's going to be a, a watered down version of therapy. Only when they're willing to move forward with it hard on a regular basis, daily, even twice a day, would I move forward with it. Because even once a week, it, and then they avoid it for the rest of the time, could make the symptoms worse. So if they're just doing the script with me once a week, but avoiding it the rest of the time, um, that wouldn't be effective exposure. It has to be deliberate, repeated. Um, in order for it to be effective. Uh, let them know that they can be in the presence of fear and in uncertainty without engaging in, in the compulsions. That's how you get better. Be in the presence of fear and uncertainty without the compulsions. I'll rate their anxiety, but let them know that the goal is not to decrease anxiety, where they're, they don't engage in this to test, like, is my anxiety still there? Is it working? Am I getting better? Um, I just rate their anxiety because I'll know that they haven't engaged in compulsions and then usually their anxiety will decrease if they don't engage in those compulsions. Okay. And then what I do assess is the changes in the intensity of the intrusive thoughts, how frequently it comes up. And I've had clients who then are like, I've done this. I've uh, written out like my my whole thing to track, like they're tracking their symptoms as they're doing it. And they're like, by the fourth time, the intrusive thoughts didn't even come up for me to, to, to track it anymore. Um, so this is just an example. Again, disclaimer, graphic content. Um, but this is how they can actually go towards the fears. Okay. Um, so I, I changed some pieces in this, but this is a very similar cognitive script that one of my clients had had. She had a fear that her child, they left their child in the car seat and he died. And it kept coming up. Her safety behaviors was then she texts her husband, she'll text the daycare to get pictures of her son to make sure he's okay. Um, she'll even have her husband send pictures of the car seat to make sure it was empty and that he didn't die there. And then you could see how that just continues to reinforce the cycle that this thought is actually real and I need to reassure it. And so, of course, she had to let go of all of the reassurances, um, but then she had to do this cognitive script. Um, so you could see how it, so brace yourself where it could be a little bit brutal, but in the present tense makes it most helpful. Um, Bob forgets to drop off Luke, which is her son. Bob forgets to drop off my son um, at my grandma's um, and then I'll, I'll, I call him and text him and we realize he, he did leave him in the car. He goes out into the car and Luke is dead. You see how gruesome that is? It feels like, am I doing malpractice or am I actually really helping this client? It feels kind of scary sometimes doing that exposure, um, but this was actually quite powerful for her. He, he, he got too hot and he died. And initially she's like in tears, feeling terrified. Um, he, we call the ambulance. Um, I then drive there to his, to Bob's work. Um, we're distraught and everyone is there. The police comes and she just sees we're on the news. I can't even get in. And so we just repeat this, repeat this again. It feels terrifying. Even if they say, you know, I, I don't know if I can move forward with this. This is so scary. I let them know you're doing a great job. If it's bringing on anxiety, you're doing exactly what you're needing to be doing. That's when we're knowing we know that it's working. So even when they're saying like, I'm feeling so scared, we just confirm that that's the, exactly what we want to see. That actually shows me you're doing exactly what you need to do in order to get better. And then we're just making sure when they're doing this, they're not praying it away, seeking reassurance. I have had a client who had even asked, do you think this could happen? And then, um, we just uh, look at like not responding to reassurances. You know, this is the intrusive thought. The important thing is let's continue to move forward with this exposure, push them through. Um, and my analogy for them is it feels like walking through a sewage pipe. It feels disgusting and gross and you want to run away and get away from there, but there will be light at the end. And so while I'm walking through this with them, I'm just going to push them through even when they feel like running away and feel scared. Okay. The last thing is how family can really help. Family then often becomes part of this OCD cycle um, because they want to help their loved ones and often their efforts to help reassure them makes things worse. The two best things family members can do is to stop reassuring their family 
and to stop helping them facilitate the avoidance. So uh, stop taking, or like, um, you know, the, the family, if the client is afraid to bathe their child, stop being the person that then takes over and being the only person that bathes them, right? So because that facilitates the avoidance. Um, so for my client who kept seeking reassurance from her husband that the child isn't in the car seat, um, her husband then started to respond with, um, they came up with how he could respond together. So it's a, a process that they come up together. Um, and then he responded with, it sounds like you're having an intrusive thought. So every time she said, oh my gosh, this look okay, is he in the car? Will you send me a picture? He would say, sounds like you're having an intrusive thought and it sounds like it'll be important to continue to do your exposure. And then that was it. He didn't respond anymore. He didn't reassure her. And that was a pretty powerful piece in that process. Okay, I wanna share a little bit about my trainings with you and then make time for questions. <laughs> we have eight minutes. Um, so I'm doing my last boot camp on mood in February. It's the last two Fridays, or it's two Fridays on the 12th and the 19th. It's my last one on mood for a while because I want to transition to boot camps on relationships and habits and addictions because there's been some requests with that. And so this will probably be the last one for the year. And if you're interested in learning more about how to help your clients overcome depression and anxiety, you can go to my training page there teamcbttraining.com forward slash trainings. I also do one-on-one -on -one trainings. It's one of my favorite things to do where you can practice Team CBT skills, uh, get preparation for your level three exam, do case consultations and get unstuck from your cases and even personal work so you can see how the tools will work for you. And Dr. Burns really believes in this heal thyself process. And once we can heal, we can be even more effective for our clients. Some resources and references of books that you can read um, there. And then let me escape for questions. Esca escape the screen share, I mean, not, not escape and leave. Okay, there's 22 thoughts in the chat. I don't know if I can read through all of that. Um, anyone who has questions can just open their mic. That may be a more effective process. And like I said, I'll respond to the chats in the email if, if the question hasn't been. Well, I wanted to ask you if we could get a copy of the uh, this presentation. Okay, I, I don't see who, who that was, but yes, if you received the email to the meeting link, the PowerPoint is in there. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay, any other thoughts or questions? Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to go through the screen to see who's talking. Tell me the name again. Marina. Oh, Marina. Hi, Marina. I'm trying to look for your face. I don't see it. Okay, what's the question or thought? Um, do you have an example? What would be the content behind the intrusive thought that I may be a pedophile? An example of the content behind it or like the, the values? Yes. Uh, well, you said that when we do um, exposure, we don't do exposure on the intrusive thought or but we, we don't, do, we don't, I may be a little bit confused. Okay, so, so we don't want to do cognitive tools that will engage in like gaining certainty, um, decreasing the probability around it, but we do want to do exposure. Um, the one client that I had with that similar thought that you said had your client, I actually was actually quite stuck and, and struggled with that case quite a bit because there were other unique components too, like there was actual an, an, an attraction to children. Never actually engaged in it. Um, so so I, I struggled with that case and ultimately it, it um, didn't didn't go to, to an, anywhere. I mean, it, it didn't get worse, but it didn't get better. Um, so when you're talking about like, what is the content of the intrusive thought, the content is that like the harm. I could hurt children. Um, I, others need to keep their kids away from me. Um, even though there hasn't ever been any evidence, there is this terror that comes up for them. And so while I haven't had a case like that again, I, I could imagine maybe there is some hidden emotion or cognitive tools could be around like, this makes me a horrible person or something along those lines when um, we could actually honor their values through the motivational model of like, it, uh, this terrifies me because I really care about children's life and well-being. 
Um, I have had clients who were afraid, like, did I touch my child inappropriately sexually? Like when I bathed my child, did I touch them inappropriately? And so they would have safety behaviors like um, holding a towel instead of directly bathing their child. Like they would only bathe their child with a towel to make sure there wasn't skin to skin contact. So exposure to that would be like, you know, you just bathe your child. <laughs> Uh, like you would if the thoughts weren't true, if they didn't have any meaning that you sexually abused your child. Um, but of course, you know, we would honor that. This terrifies me because I really care about children's well-being. I care about them not getting abused, protecting them. I care about their safety. We would do cognitive tools around their fears of being bad or evil or something along those lines. And then we could um, look at exposure uh, with how to continue to move forward. They may even like completely avoid changing diapers or um, having any kind of skin to skin contact with their child, which is kind of heartbreaking. And so it's quite powerful and liberating because you know they really care about uh, the connection. And so the exposure would be then and engage with your children as if your thoughts didn't have any meaning, despite the potential risk, despite the uncertainty, how would you proceed with life anyway? And then as they continue to proceed with life, often the intrusive thoughts get less powerful, get less sticky. Even if it comes up, they can deal with it in more effective ways. Um, and, and likely sometimes there could be a hidden emotion too. Okay, did that answer your question, Marina? Or did that make things more confusing? Well, I can just see how this case could be complicated because the obs obsession, um, the obsession is the thought, and the compulsion is masturbation or looking at the uh, looking at porn. So it's. Oh. I am just guessing it's going to be very complicated. The obsession is the thought that I could be a pedophile. The compulsion is porn. Wow, I'm kind of even thinking of like habits and addiction treatment more so than exposure you know where you, you don't want them to like have more exposure to the obsession of like children or, or pedophilic content you actually may want to actually do things to decrease the compulsions um, and, and treating the habits and addiction instead it is a complex case Marina, for sure yeah there there are these like steps and then there are certain cases that are then like okay. Kind of makes this question what what is no, it was the most effective helpful. route anyway, it was very helpful so i'll just review it again and hopefully i'll get some more out of it i just have to stick with it for a little bit like with habits and addictions yeah because that to me sounds more like less of like an i don't know but possibly like an anxiety provoking intrusive thought as more of like a, like an urge and seeking I, I don't know there's probably a lot um seeking physical sensation pleasures or some, something along those lines. Okay, um, I can take one more question or thought. Hi, Looks Michael. like that's it. I, oh, I know, okay, Angela. I know, you, I know you answered one of mine already, but um, this is, Coming up for me when I was thinking about the testing and, and you were saying how you would track the intensity and the frequency of, of the compulsion. Do you adjust your BMS then so that you're tracking that before and after every session or, or how do you go about that as far as the mm -hmm. testing portion? Um, I uh, assess the intensity and frequency of the intrusive thoughts and, and, and likely the compulsions too. I don't incorporate it into the brief mood survey, but uh, when I'm doing exposure with them, I'll kind of assess it before and, and after. So if they did it for homework, I would say any changes, any shifts in your intrusive thoughts. So I would have clients who say, typically it would come up multiple times a day. And last week it only came up once. So that's when we know like they are fully doing the exposure. Um, and, and again, the goal is not to get rid of the intrusive thoughts, but I know it's decreasing because they've started to let go of the compulsions or the mental acts. And so it got less sticky, it's coming up less, or it, it, it started to bother them less. So maybe the fr frequency, uh, the frequency will often always decrease, um, but also like the disturbance that came with it will often decrease too as they practice just noticing it instead of fighting it, instead of making meaning out of that thought. 
Okay, did that answer your question, An Angela? Okay, great. All right, thank you so much, everyone. I apologize that there wasn't more time to answer questions, but I will copy this chat and then answer any pieces that I, I feel like was, wasn't answered and send that to you. Um, I hope that material was helpful and there are pieces that just like through troubleshooting, like why am I so stuck where things not working that, that has worked for me, so. Um, okay, yeah, there's questions about assessment tools. I'll send all of that to you. I hope you have a good, uh, great rest of your day and week. And um, when I answer the questions and if you felt like it still wasn't answered, feel free to contact me. I, I really love our team community, to be honest with you. It feels like such a privilege to uh, connect with all of these uh, awesome therapists who just truly care about the quality of our work. Like what other treatment model forces you to rate how you're doing before and after every session, right? So it's just such a privilege to do this work. So feel free to email me with any questions. I love connecting with all of you. Okay, thanks so much, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Good seeing everyone. Good seeing everyone. Good to see you, Ellen. Take care. Oh, hi. Okay, is it Nyla? Nila? Uh -huh. Nyla. Uh -huh. Nyla, it's so Nyla. good to see you. Me too. Good Thank to put you. Good to a face to the name of, of the person mm -hmm. that we've been communicating with. Yes, ma'am. Take yeah. care. You take care too. See you, sorry. Bye, Ed. And all, all of our new people too. And you looks like you could join today. That was great. I didn't get to see you earlier. Okay, and Dr. Ahmed. I've seen his name around. All right, so I'm just copying this chat. Is it Joy? It's good to see you. Joy, thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you, Ty. It was wonderful. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm glad that it felt helpful. And is it? Uh, uh, I'm joining in. Say that again, Joy. Westland. I go with. I go by Westland. Oh, you go by Westland. I'm sorry. I I assumed that was like a, a last name. Your name is Westland. I apologize. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um. I'm I'm logging in from India, so it was wonderful. You, thank you so much for joining all the way from overseas. That is so awesome. I feel so privileged to get to connect with. The, Someone from a whole nother continent as well. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> really, it's like 11? Really like 11 p.m. Uh, there or something? No, it's 12.30. It's 12.30? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. You've really had to dedicate yourself to join. Are you exhausted and ready for bed? Um, yeah. I'm also, I have so many thoughts from all the learning. So I think I'm oh going to take God. a little bit of time to wind down <laughs> yeah. with all the excitement. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I've got to wind down. So and thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so Wesleyan, for, for Bye -bye. joining. Bye-bye. Uh, hi, Ty. Uh, hi, Ann. Uh, 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 Ty, uh, my name is Rizwan. Uh, Rizwan. I really enjoyed this. Rizwan, yes. I really enjoyed the session today. Uh, uh, I, yeah, yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I'm a medical graduate, but currently I am in a, in a diplomatic service. But uh, why I was particularly interested in psychotherapy and particularly in your session was because one of my son, the oldest one, has OCD. Ah, yeah. So, so he had been uh, in the uh, suffering from uh, this disorder since last ten years. Oh my goodness! Uh, yes, it's a lot of suffering. Recently, yes. So uh, I'm sorry. Was, uh, uh, let, uh, let me go ahead and stop this recording because I feel like it's a, a bit private, just to protect your privacy here.